The uh, title of my talk is Is Society Built on Intentions? The Question of Social Ontology. The concept of social ontology is a relatively new one. It can be considered to mean at least two things. Social ontology can be the project of exhibiting the social world in which people live and out of which they understand themselves and their environment as an existential determination of human Dasein and examining it in this way. Supporting this definition are Martin Heidegger's analysis of the being with in being and time, Michael Toynesen's 1965 The Other Studies in the Social Ontology of Husserl, Heidegger, Sartre and Huber, along with Panyol. Anayotis, sorry, Condiles, Das Politische und der Mensch, Grundzüge der Sozialontologie, which was published posthumously in 1999. On the other hand, however, one can also speak of social ontology when it comes to explaining how social entities occur in a world defined by natural sciences, entities which can sufficiently explain neither by physics nor by biology. As representative of this, I just mentioned on social facts, <coughs> facts by Margaret Gilbert, uh, uh, who was already mentioned uh, by Mr. Babbage, which came out in 1989, and John Searle's The Construction of Social Reality from 1995. If we understand social ontology <coughs> in this second way, its decisive question can be formulated as such. What distinguishes society qua society? What is the common link between all these institutions in which social interaction and conversation takes place? What makes a circle of friends, a music society, a philosophical department, a parliament, more than just the sum of its members? Are there actually any genuine social objects and how are they constituted? Social ontology therefore tells us which universal factors and forces make society a society and separate it from that what does not belong to society. One of the most important aspects to note hereby is the opposition in which the word social is used. As with all other words in the language, its meaning depends on the context and how it is used in relation to other words. And the contrast that is relevant here is palpable in the new comparison of social and natural sciences. Nature is then to be causally understood as the entirety of what man himself has not produced, but leaves room for him to have an effect on it and fill it with his imagination and creativity. Social, on the other hand, is that which is made by human beings. The context and results of actions of which it can be sensibly said that they did not exist without man. It is in this sense that Searle, for example, uses the word. Subsequent to a paper by Anscombe in 1958, he distinguishes between social facts, or as we've already heard, institutional facts, as Anscombe calls them, and on the other hand, raw facts, respectively brute facts in the language of Anscombe. According to Searle, the world of raw facts is pre-given to us, for it exists entirely without our help. In this, he conclude, sorry, in this he includes everything that falls within the subject matter of physics and biology. The movement of atoms, the density of solids, the existence of different species of animals, the evolution, etc. This is different to the social sphere. The world of social facts has its origin and development in human behavior and interpersonal interaction. State presidents, works of art, and good manners do not exist anyway. There must be people who believe that there are state presidents, works of art, and good manners, and who explicitly and implicitly demonstrate this in their behavior. An overwhelming number of social phenomena is characterized by the fact that people share their beliefs and intentions with each other, join forces and establish common practices and social institutions. For about two decades, the conceptual foundations and particularities of these phenomena have been summarized and increasingly interdisciplinarily uh, discussed under the heading collective intentionality. The formation of social networks and thus the emergence of a social realm is explained from the smallest atoms of which society is composed, the individuals, and their intentionality. 
The question of the being of society is thus uncovered as the question of whether there is such a thing as common or we intentionality, when exactly you can talk about it, and above all, if it can be reduced to the individual or I intentionality of the individuals. This theoretic approach to the social, anchored in the intentions of actors, is already found in modern thinking alongside the founding fathers of sociology as a distinct discipline. Max Weber, for example, in his basic concepts of sociology, focuses on the conceptual apparatus and the method methodological foundations of sociology. Here it can be already studied what it might mean that society is based on intentions. Let's take a look. Max Weber begins by defining what it means that people act. Action is one of the basic concepts of all social events and thus one of the major categories of the social scientist. Society is only where actions take place and close ranks into a complex network of institutions, organizations and discourses. And action is to be said, I quote Max Weber, a human behavior regardless of whether it is external or internal action, failure or refrain, if and insofar the actor or actors associate with this with it a subjective meaning. End of quote. Without going into detail on the theoretical vocable meaning, this does not mean a somehow object objectively correct or metaphysically true sense. Meaning is instead the direction and the sense that an agent itself actually attaches to his or her acting. Subsequent to the meaning of action, the social then comes into play. I quote again, action is social if the acting individual takes account of the behavior of others and is thereby oriented in its course. End of quote. According to this, social action is based on the past, present or expected behavior of others. These others can be individuals and acquaintances or an infinite number of people and complete strangers. What matters is that not every encounter between people already has a social character. Weber gives an example. If two cyclists collide, then it is just a mere event like a natural process. But their attempt to avoid each other, or the attempt to ram the other person, together with the following name-calling, raw or peaceful discussion, would be a social event. For Max Weber, therefore, so social sorry. For Max Weber, therefore, sociality concerns the intention with which behavior takes place. Whether an action is to be qualified as social or not depends on a specific sense orientation of the actors involved. A simple uniform act by itself is not enough. If people in the street simultaneously open their umbrella at the beginning of a rainstorm or try to take cover in doorways or under trees, the action of each person is usually not based on that of the other persons around, but is rather seeking for protection from getting wet. The relevant determination that makes an action a social one, and thus a part of society, is that one person is adjusting to others, and that the meaning of his or her action specifies itself in relation to the actual or potential behavior of at least one other person. Max Weber therefore sees the basic fact of social life in the process of conscious and purposeful behavior which unfolds itself either in one-sidedness or in reciprocity. This model of intentionality has been recently made prominent by Searle. In his 1995 book, The Construction of Social Reality, and in many subsequent writings, including Making the Social World, The Structure of Human Civilization, which was published 2010, he deals with the question of social ontology in terms of consciousness, the observer, and of intentionality. So, however, combines the idea of what he calls collective intentionality with the concept of the attribution of functions and the concept of constitutive rules. For him, all three elements together define the social sphere. To begin with, 
Collective intentionality means the ability to behave cooperatively and to share the same intentions, as he defines it. Intentions are states such as beliefs, desires, and purposes. <coughs> states, therefore, in which someone is when he or she is eager for or directed to something. Besides a singular intentionality, there is also a collective one. To illustrate this, Searle uses the example of someone playing as a violinist in an orchestra. Such a person plays their part only in the common performance of the symphony and remains in their behavior meaningfully related to that of the others. Or, as Searle's second example goes, if someone participates as a striker in a football match. He will maybe block the defender in the opposing team, but he does this as part of a team and as part of a joint offensive game. Collective intentionality is thus, perme sorry, collective intentionality is thus permeated by a kind of we consciousness. The individual is aware that their actions are interlaced with a wider context involving other people. And it is this context which they have in mind in so far as they adjust their behavior to it. The intention of every participant begins with we intend. I quote so, by stipulating I will henceforth use the expression social fact to refer to any fact involving collective intentionality. So, for example, the fact that two people are going for a walk together is a social fact. End of quote. The second concept, the attribu attribution of functions, means the faculty of humans and of some animal species to ascribe functions to things. These may be natural objects or those that are specifically made to fulfill the functions imposed upon them. Of course, we live in a world of chairs and tables, houses and cars, lecture rooms, images, streets, gardens, and so forth. But even natural occurrences, such as rivers or trees, can play a functional role in our lives and be judged on how well or badly they carry out this function. A river can be good for swimming in, a certain type of tree may be particularly suitable to build houses out of. And this allocation of, function, and this allocation of functions is done as an intentional act. I quote again. The important thing to see at this point is that functions never are intrinsic to the physics of any phenomenon, but are assigned from outside by conscious observers and users. Functions are always observer relative." End of quote. Finally, concerning the notion of constitutive rules, it is the thereby described phenomenon which distinguishes man from all other living beings, according to Searle. What characterizes human action above all else is, according to Searle, not, as it is for Weber, that it is deliberately, deliberately done or that it functionally calls upon things in its execution. Searle has already developed the concept of constitutive rules in his philosophy of, of language and his philosophy of mind. In particular, in speech acts of 1969, he uses the distinction between re regulative and constitutive rules introduced by Geoffrey Mitchley in his essay Linguistic Rules. According to this, constitutive rules establish new behavior patterns that would not exist without these rules. Regulative rules, however, turn already existing practices in other directions. For example, the rule to drive on the right side of the road regulates driving a car, but driving a car was already possible before the existence of such a rule. By contrast, the rule of playing chess inaugurate this activity in the first place. What matters in our context is that constitutive rules are formed and reproduced in the interplay of collective intentionality and the attribution of functions. A community of people can attribute a function to something which the object in question does not already have by virtue of its physical properties. And this function is based on the common recognition of the object in question as something. So I have summarized this in the handy principle X counts as Y in context C. A piece of paper, for example, counts in a specific context as a means for payment. 
or a stone can carry the function of a boundary stone. The same function could also be imputed to a number of spires rammed into the ground when a community recognizes this line as a boundary and then direct their actions by it. That something counts as a boundary is constituted by a common rule. Social, in the sense of so, therefore, is what is added to the raw facts of nature through collective attribution of status constituting, constituting an extra dimension. Searle's social ontological thesis have not remained unchallenged. By this I do not mean those responses that could have been raised from the corner of the soci sociological system theory. These responses amount to saying that the explanation of society from the intentions of the persons involved, as proposed by Weber and Searle, was in vain. For the consciousness of the actors belonged to the environment of social systems and was not part of their, as they call it, autopoiesis. The debate between Jürgen Habermas and Niklas Luhmann for an adequate and timely access to the social realm is as up to date as it was. I will concede to Sir, however, that who speaks about society always has to speak about the interests and plans of the actors bound together as a society. Instead, my objections have a different direction of impact. In my opinion, there are at least two things which earn criticism. On the one hand, the basic law of the social, as Searle puts it. On the other hand, the concept of collective intentionality. I begin with Searle's law, X counts as Y in context C. This law, which in Searle's view runs through and constitutes society, remains obviously abstract. Let us clarify this by using an example. We have previously assumed that a piece of paper you have shown previously in the five uh, euro note, that a piece of paper uh, counts in the context of a particular community as a means for payment. A piece of paper, for instance, on which you can see certain symbols, which has a certain color or certain patterns, and on which a certain amount is noted, say five, has a certain value. It has the exchange value of five euro. For what in this case Searle's variable C stands is clear. It stands for the means of payment. The context Y can also be easily determined. It is about the scope of the European Economic and Monetary Union. But, and this is the interesting question, what is X? We have said a piece of paper. According to Searle, to solve basic law, it is a piece of paper which counts within the scope of the European Economic and Monetary Union as a five euro note. However, there is something wrong with this answer. For X, that is a piece of paper, had to be a brute fact, according to Searle, something which precedes the dimension of the social and its functional use by the members of a society. As a reminder, the world of brute fact means the total of the given entities, the natural things which exist without our help. Now, it is, however, a fact that a piece of paper is nothing about which one would seriously say that it already exists. Paper does not exist in a way rocks, trees, and clouds exist. It is not entirely independent of any action of humans. A piece of paper is just an artifact. In any case, a clear demarcation between nature and society seems hardly possible today if one considers, for example, that scientific and technological intervention of man blurs the boundary between untouched nature and social space. But this is not enough. More fundamental is, however, that one cannot determine what this ominous X is without having it already determined as that as what it appears in a particular context. To think of a piece of paper as what it is, namely a piece of paper, already means to integrate it into a horizon of possibilities. To a piece of paper essentially belongs the entire diversity of the ways it can be used and met. What you can say about it, when and where and who can use it, that you can buy and write on it, that it is made of wood, that you can tinker hats and small glitters out of it, and so on. 
a piece of paper in our everyday life is all this and much more, all these possibilities are part of its being. How then can I determine that X without any reference to that as what it appears in a particular context? How do I distinguish between what it is and as what it counts for? Even assuming that a piece of paper was a brute fact, what it is obviously not, but just assuming, must we not say that even brute facts are for us as what we have disclosed them in one way or another and thus integrated them into the whole of our active work and conceptual description? In other words, that X is never socially undetermined and completely unknown, as so seems to imply. My second point of critique concerns the concept of intentionality, respectively collective intentionality. The fundamental challenge of any social ontology operating with the concept of intentionality and constructing the social alone on it is that it remains one-sided. The model of intentionality falls short. It lacks complexity in several respects. Let me just mention two counterexamples. Firstly, there is what might be briefly called a solitary act, I mean the following. Imagine someone who is deeply rooted in the country life of southern Germany and lives, let us say, in Tottenauberg in a small hut. Let us call him Martin. As is custom, Martin has learned from his father and copied from the other residents of the village how to make firewood. That is, which type of tree of the southern black forest is best suited for it, how it must be cut, cut with a small axe in the most adequate way, how to saw it up and process it into pieces. And just as Martin has learned and practiced for years, he still practices it week after week. Uh, as you can imagine, I refer to the famous uh, photo on which you can see uh, Martin Heidegger with uh, the young gardener uh, sawing a piece of wood. So, this example is interesting as, on the one hand, one can hardly say that Martin, whenever he makes firewood in the usual way, consciously thinks of others and their way of making firewood. He does not make it the way he makes it because it comes to his mind that others are doing, in, are doing it in exactly this way. Therefore, Martin is not acting towards others. He is not attuned to the behavior of others. In the words, words of Searle, his, in, his intention is a singular one. And yet, on the other hand, in Martin's action, society indeed continues to, to determine itself. Or how should we understand it that he cuts in a way it is normally done? That his behavior shows conformities with the behavior of others. Without him noticing, regularities are manifested in his actions that are not only the regularities of his action alone, but commonly shared regularities of a social practice. <coughs> Therefore, although his action is a solitary one, its sense cannot be separated from the world of socially mediated conventions and traditions. <coughs> I would also like to name a second respect in which the model of intentionality seems to be unsatisfactory. For not only our external actions, if we chop wood or do anything else principally visible for everybody, but also our quiet reflection in a thoughtful moment is not without any reference to common life with others. Because we have to accept that the orders in which our life takes place often emanate in a lengthy and in detail hardly compreh comprehensible historical process from the exchange with others and the building of a common world. And these orders, consolidated more or less through socialization, education and habit, prove their power over us even when we do not consciously notice it. The language we speak is not a private invention, and our language-based thinking moves within many restrictions and requirements that are not only our own. Whatever it may be, therefore, that fascinates our mind, all thinking, desiring and feeling seems to have 
certain kinds of social aspects without us being intentionally and knowingly oriented towards others. What I want to say is that a social ontology centered around intentions shortens the social to that what the members of a cultural community consciously perceive and intend. It means a positivist narrowing of the concept of society if one explains the social world too much as the object of representing and willing and thus solely defines it by intentions. The influence of society seems to go much further and seems to determine the human being more profoundly as Weber, Searle and others admit. For each such representing and willing actually remain melted into the whole of human life, including essentially the being with, with others, and in the continuous flow of meaning that characterizes our existence. But we are never aware of this circumstance in all its breadth and depth. It is true that the orders of a social and historical world are only in Sorry, it is true that the orders of a social and historical world are only built up and only continue to develop and change where people pursue interests and intentions. But it is also true that these orders are not restricted to this. It is not these intentions alone on which the social and historical world is based. Rather, they remain surrounded by a horizon of indefinite, and mostly unnoticed conventions and practices which are manifest in our thinking and acting, acting and which orient it. I come to the end. Therefore, it finally seems to me that the social ontology, as it can be found in Weber, Searle and others, remains sublated in that first understanding of social ontology which I have differentiated at the beginning of my presentation. If social ontology is the project to exhibit before any positive and investigation and prior to any empirical question, to exhibit the being of the social and separate it from what does not belong to it, then this project must acknowledge that it is surpassed by that with which it is concerned. What it deals with is at the same time that by which it is itself rendered possible and supported. The living with others in a historical world as an existential characteristic of human existence. And that can never completely be objectified and, as it were, neutrally classified. The difference between the social and the natural realm is no difference only of two classes of objects or facts, as so puts it. Preconceptions and prejudgments are effective even in the apprehending knowledge of the natural scientists, which flexibly but steadily determine them and schematize their cognitive faculty in advance. In this respect, we must recognize that what we take as natural thing, because it is not created by human beings, even though we take influence on it, is always already mediated with our common conceptual equipment and coordinated practices and thus interpreted in their life. Thank you very much.